Hi friends, this is Sister Shiro, Fearless and Fiery for Christ. And friends, today I want to talk about something that has been on my heart. And it's about the prosperity gospel. A lot of us have probably been in prosperity gospel churches or are in currently prosperity gospel churches. And especially if you are in one, this message is really for you. But it can be for anyone who's listening. But my heart really goes out to those who are still in those churches and in those assemblies. Because friends, you see, for decades there has been an extreme emphasis on wealth and prosperity. And it has virtually drowned out the message of the cross. On Christian television and this has really damaged the evangelical movement the prosperity gospel teaches among other things that believers have a right to the blessings of health and wealth and they can obtain these blessings through positive confessions of faith and the sowing of seeds through the faithful payments of tithes and offerings Oh, and let me tell you, friends, I should know, I should know, because I was in a church previously uh, that was really heavy on the word of faith gospel. So I am no stranger to this. It's actually out of experience. It's not just something I have read about. And so I find the prosperity gospel to be wrong on so many levels. I dislike, nay, hate the way it makes out Jesus to be this genie in a bottle, you know, a magical Santa Claus who just dishes out things to us. I dislike the fact that it rarely mentions the cross, you know, the blood of Jesus, the atoning sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. And it does not align with scripture. This is a gospel where many of the preachers simply cherry pick a few scriptures here and there. I mean, take a couple of scriptures randomly, I tell you, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament and see for yourself whether this is true or not. That this gospel does not align with scripture the people and the preachers who push this gospel would like us to believe that this prosperity gospel is really heavy in the word of God, in the Bible. You would think that we have hundreds upon thousands of scriptures that are simply talking about this health and wealth gospel. But no, I tell you, friend, pick up your Bible right now and just take a couple of scriptures and see. For example... If I was to just look at Second Peter right now, Second uh, Peter probably chapter three and verse five, uh, what does it say? It says, "For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water." Uh, nothing about prosperity there, and richness and health and wealth. Maybe I can think of something else. Um, I don't know. James uh, chapter two verse uh, nine. Yeah. Um, yeah. It says, "But if you show partiality, you commit sin, and are convicted by the law as transgressors." Let me take another scripture, another random one. Ephesians three um, verse eight. To me. Who I am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now when you think about that word riches, it's not really the, the, the riches of money. The unsearchable riches of Christ, the, the treasures of wisdom, the treasures of love that are within Christ light and glory and honor there are so many things about our lord jesus christ that we do not know the unsearchable riches of our savior 
Uh, let me pick another random one. Philippians um, chapter 2 verse 10. That you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now friends, those are four scriptures that I just randomly picked. And no talk of the health and the wealth and you know the, the goodies of this world and do you know why we can't find that even in those four random scriptures because that gospel that they push is not really the true gospel you see when you read the new testament you find that their writers talked over and over about walking in the spirit uh, healing the old man walking in love enduring tribulation and suffering, rejecting false doctrines. This was the bulk of the message. Nothing about how God wants you to be happy and rich. Nothing about acquiring the things of this world. But actually, there are a few verses that talk about not loving the world. What's awful about this gospel is that it promises that your life is going to be completely different, radically changed, you know, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. There is this God, this promise that everything will be completely different from what Christ went through. Instead, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be wealthy. But if you do lack health or wealth, it's because you do not have enough faith. But this is what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you, as though something strange were happening to you. But what the prosperity gospel teaches is, hey, be surprised if there's any type of trial in your life. You know, God is our Heavenly Father and He wants us to experience the best. So, the trials in your life, I mean, there must be something. What is it? Are, are you praying enough? Are you reading the word enough? Are you have, do you have enough faith? There's always the doing. You're not doing in, enough to earn God's favor for you to live this pristine, wonderful life. Something else, friends, there is no wrath in this prosperity preaching. No wrath of God. God is love, 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 and nothing else. The doctrine is completely out of balance. It has a very imbalanced view of God. But we know that God cannot be God without all his attributes. In scripture, we see the God who heals and we see the God who struck Herod for not giving God his glory in Acts. We see Jesus healing two blind men in the book of Matthew, but we also see Jesus striking Paul is a three-day blindness. But then Paul went to become one of the greatest apostles ever, spreading the gospel far and wide. So the talk is God is love, 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 giving, 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 just have enough faith and God will give you, but not enough, enough talk of this other attribute of God that he, he he gets angry. I mean, you read the Old Testament. They like quoting the Old Testament scriptures of Abraham and how, how much he had his riches, Job and his camels and whatnot. But they don't like talking about God and how angry he became many times over Israel's rebellion and disobedience. That is God. And we know we know that this age of grace is soon coming to an end. We know that the, the, the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation 7, the wrath of the Lamb is going to be poured upon unrepentant mankind. So this is a very imbalanced gospel. And not that wealth is bad in itself, because God blessed many with riches and wealth but it is the love of money that is the issue and many scriptures actually have a balanced view of wealth 
that many of these preachers unfortunately will not quote like first timothy 6 verse 9 to 10 which says but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It is the love of money that has made many backslide as they pursue very passionately the things of this world as they take shortcuts so that they can have the things of this world. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. 1 Timothy 6, 17-19 As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. That is the Apostle Paul charging those who are rich in his days not to be haughty and not to put their hopes on the uncertainty of riches because riches, friends, are not certain. You may be rich in this season and there may come another season where you are not rich where you're going through economic hardships what will you do if you are holding on to this plastic gospel of how god wants you to be healthy and wealthy with no hardships and no tribulations what will you do if you are holding on to this plastic gospel you need to prepare yourselves we need to know that there are good times and there are hard times even for us born again Christians, which I find to be a really weird word, you know, born again Christians, because all Christians are born again. But sorry, guys, I'm digressing. The prosperity gospel uh, denies the relationship between work and wealth. There is little to no talk of diligence. You know, have faith, uh, tithe, and your finances will manifest. You know, manifest. I mean, what is it with these new age terms anyway? And yet, diligence is talked about over and over, especially in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 12, verse 24. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. Proverbs 10, verse 4. Lazy hands make for poverty. But diligent hands bring wealth. And we have a couple of others. Proverbs 6, uh, verses 6 to 8, that talks about the ant and how industrious the ant is. Colossians 3, verses 23, which talks about whatever it is you're doing, you know, you work at it with all of your heart. Uh, Second Thessalonians, that talks about those who do not work should also not eat various scriptures friends the prosperity gospel my friends there is very little to no talk of saving souls for christ millions of souls are dying having not given their souls to the lord jesus christ millions are on the wide road that leads to destruction but many of the prosperity preachers are concerned with making you as comfortable as you can be in this earth and yet friends and yet we are told in colossians 3 verse 2 to set our minds on things above and not on earthly things so you find very little talk of bringing souls to the lord jesus christ and when they do talk about bringing souls it's you know just come to know this savior come to know this lord and you know he will change your life and and when you have enough faith you know your life will be good your life 
will have very little issues very very little discomfort so you just just come it all goes back to that jesus who is a santa clausy oh friends i tell you instead of having our affections on the cars the jets the yachts the big houses that this system offers our affections should be on the souls of men the cry of our heart and the cry of this preachers should be use us lord to save a soul for you today this week this month our prayers instead of being incessantly about things and our wants and desires should also be about the salvation of our family members our friends our colleagues our business partners because friends who wants who wants to see their parent being sent to the lake of fire who wants to see your friend who, um, your friend's name not in the book of life who wants to see this who does not want to see their their, their, their relatives you know in the new age to come in the new heaven and in the new earth who doesn't want and therefore we pray for our friends we pray for our family members we cannot simply be focused on asking god for the things of this world james said in james chapter 4 verse 3 that you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions the lord told us that in this world we would have trouble but we are not to fear because he had overcome the world. Jesus did not say that in this world you will have trouble. Fear not because you simply need to declare and decree and all your troubles will disappear. No, he did not say that. He said that he had overcome the world. And friends, we know that in the end, God wins. The prosperity gospel makes its adherents live in guilt. The guilt of not having enough faith. You've lost your job. You didn't have enough faith. Your marriage didn't work out. Mm -mm. It's your faith, man. It's your faith. That's a problem. You're in a bad financial season. Hey, check your faith. Your faith is really low. You've been married for five years. No child. Hey, I mean, you need to up your faith. Just have enough faith and turn it around. That cancer is still an issue. Hey, you need to check your faith. On and on it goes. Now, scripture does teach that the devil comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. Scripture does teach. We see it in the Gospels, especially where Jesus said your faith has, has made you whole. We see also where Jesus would heal people who had not even called out to him. He just healed them out of his compassion. This doctrine forgets the grace of God. That he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so you may have cancer. It's not because you, 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 you don't have enough faith. But it's because we live in a fallen world. And you may have an atheist neighbor who is as fit as a fiddle. He has zero faith. He doesn't believe in God. But it's, it's the grace of God. The prosperity gospel ignores the fact that you know, we are encouraged to be contented in scripture. The health and wealth gospel teaches that more is always better, you know. You can always have more, more, more. There can never be enough. And that continual desire for more brings about a form of spiritual poverty and encourages covetousness, which God hates. So friends, in light of scripture, the prosperity gospel is fundamentally flawed. It is a false gospel that you need to reject with all firmness because of its faulty view of the relationship between God and man. Friends, we need to know God, truly know him and truly know him 
by reading his word. That's one of the, the, the ways to protect yourself from all the deceit that is in this world, all the deception in the church, the deception in the world. And it's a great way to know the Father. You know, God to the prosperity preachers is simply a cosmic Santa Claus. He has no sovereignty, you know, and it all revolves around man and his needs and his need for a breakthrough. But friends, God is not a cosmic Santa Claus. He is a father. He is our heavenly father. And if you're a parent, you know that you don't dish out every single thing your child asks for. You don't dish it out. You, you have wisdom. Because if it was up to our kids, they would eat a burger every day or they would have pizza every day. Breakfast, lunch, and supper. But as their parents, we know. We know that would be foolish to give in to such a request. And our father is not a Santa Claus who just dishes out everything. He knows when to give us uh, what we need. He knows how. He knows why. You know, our father knows the end from the beginning. And you need to know the Lord. Truly know him for yourself. You pick up that Bible and start reading it. And you will truly know him and you will know the truth from lies you will know the real from the counterfeit we who are followers of christ are looking forward to a heavenly city whose foundation is god a city where there will be no tears no pain no death joy will abound the curse will be gone that's what it says in revelation chapter 22 verse 3 no longer Will there be any curse? The throne of God and of the Lamb will be within the city, and his servants will worship him. That is what we are waiting for. A heavenly city whose foundations is God. But we know that before that happens, we need to go through through another time that will be very, very challenging. We know there will be a tribulation. The Bible says that there is a time where there will be great tribulation, great trouble. And that's another thing with this gospel. They do very little to prepare people for the end times. There is little to no talk about an antichrist who seems right now to be just around the corner. There is little to no talk of a future mark of the beast, you know, that will be required to be put on all people or else beheadment or beheading. Little to no talk of a rapture. Little to no talk of a millennial reign where our Savior will be ruling on earth. Um, no preparation of the church of a soon coming persecution because true Christians the true remnant of God will be persecuted in the near future, folks. So this gospel, it does not prepare people for the end times. We are in the end times. I believe that we are in the end times. And this is a time where we really don't need to have our ears tickled, but rather we need to have discernment. We need to have wisdom. We need to have truth. We need to have strength for the journey. We don't need to have our ears tickled. So friends, the prosperity gospel is a false gospel. And where you find the truth is in the word of God, in the Bible. And trust me that once you make it a habit to read your Bible regularly, praying and seeking wisdom and discernment from the Holy Spirit, your eyes will be flooded with the true light from the Most High God. So friends, if this has struck a chord somewhere, you can like my video, you can share it with a friend who you probably know is struggling, you know, with this prosperity gospel thingy. You know, share it with them, like the video, and we will talk next time. Be blessed.